Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's my absolute honor and privilege to welcome Mr. Robert Spencer, who's uh, graciously agreed to join us today. Um, so I'm going to introduce him. And I was just telling uh, Mr. Spencer that I've jotted everything that I need to say to introduce him. I'm sorry, there's some um, echo. Yeah. Uh, so in 2003, Mr. Spencer founded Jihad Watch, which chronicles crimes uh, of a jihadi nature. He co-founded Stop Islamization of America. And uh, two of his books uh, reportedly were listed by the FBI as training material. Um, he you know, defines himself, uh, himself as an Islamophobe of the good kind. And yep. uh, interestingly, Wikipedia is not accurate. That's not it's, accurate. Well, Wikipedia is it's it's Wikipedia has is is trying to make it sound all negative. And what no, I was no. the point I was making when I said an Islamophobe was that anybody who is in against beheading and the stoning of adulterers and the jihad violence against unbelievers and the supremacist building of mosques on the uh, holy places of other faiths, that's all Islamophobia. If that's Islamophobia, everyone should be an Islamophobe. But the, uh, you mean, Mr. Spencer, our audience members actually uh, identify with that definition uh, more than anybody else. Uh, I'll just finish saying this. Uh, interestingly, uh, I think our audience are going to be extremely interested to know that Pakistan banned one of his books. Malaysia banned another book of his. And um, he has been banned from entering the United Kingdom, apparently for life. And many universities uh, have invited Mr. Spencer to speak. And in some of them, he, he has been shouted down and heckled. And so far, he's written 19 books. Now, I firmly believe that a man should be judged not just by his accomplishments, but by the nature of opposition he faces. And uh, given the kind of opposition Mr. Spencer has faced, I can, uh, you know, as an authority, say that he is one of the foremost people we should be listening to. Thank you so, very much. So I think we can start, you know, this genre of writing is something that not a lot of people really um, enter because it's, uh, you know, the path to this sort of writing is full of threats and the kind of opposition that you've already experienced in your life. So could you tell us something about what really got you interested and what got you to start writing about uh, radicalism and jihad? There's no doubt you're absolutely right. Uh, people don't do this because the pressures are too great for the most part. Uh, not only death threats, but all the defamation, all the negativity, like the Wikipedia bio. Everything, uh, if you search me on the internet, you'll find 99% of it is negative. This is what happens, of course, not just to me, but to anybody who speaks the truth about these issues. In any case, uh, I got interested because of my family. My grandparents were from the Ottoman Empire, the last Islamic caliphate, and they were exiled in uh, 1916 for declining to convert to Islam. And all the uh, Christians of that area were who'd been there for well over 2,000 years, they, uh, the, before they were Christians, they were there. They were exiled from that land in what is now Turkey. I wanted to know what had happened. I uh, asked them what had happened. They told me how wonderful it was over there growing up. And I said, well, then why did you leave? Well, we were exiled. Why were you exiled? They either would not or could not tell me. So I started to study and try to find out on my own. That leads one directly into Islamic doctrine because it all had to do with the choice that non-believers are given in Islam of conversion or subjugation as a second class citizen, not even really a citizen at all, but says second class or death. And so they uh, were given the chance of exile. Actually, my great grandfather was killed as they were leaving and they all probably would have been killed if they had stayed, if they had not converted. So as I understand, you belong to the Greek Orthodox Church. And uh, you know one punchline that at least I have come across in my short career covering uh, jihadist crime is that Islam is a peaceful religion. 
and uh, it's the adherents of Islam and some of the adherents who twist the faith uh, to use it to propagate uh, violence and to harm other people. So could, you, could we start with this comment and this sentence that Islam is a religion of peace? And what are you, your views on that? Certainly, there's a, there's a bit of truth to it. All great falsehoods, all big lies are built on a kernel of truth. And in this case, it comes from the etymological root of the word. In Arabic, sulm, the S-L-M root, the consonant root of the word is uh, peace, salam. But also you can make Islam out of that, which is submission. It's the same root of the word they share, peace and submission, because of course, true peace comes from submission to Allah. And true peace in society comes from the submission of the non-Muslims to the Muslims, as is dictated in the Quran. So when they say Islam is a religion of peace, they're not just lying outright, but the peace that they envision is not the peace that non-Muslims would envision, which would be mutual coexistence as equals on an indefinite basis in a secular society. Rather, it is a piece of the hegemony of Islam and the uh, devaluation and dehumanization of the unbelievers. This is uh, the, only, is the, the only religion, Islam, that has doctrines of warfare calling for uh, the conquest of the unbelievers, the destruction of their political systems, and the establishment of the Islamic system wherever possible. And so uh, for 1400 years, we have seen Muslims actually live this out. And this is kind of ironic in light of these claims that Islam is a religion of peace, but those claims also rely on non-believers having an ignorance of history and not realizing that for 1400 years, Muslims have been waging war against non-Muslims and attempting to bring them under the rule of Islamic law, which denies them basic rights. It's interesting that you would say that because uh, I think Islam being a religion of peace is one sentence which is thrown in our faces every time anybody really tries to criticize uh, jihadism or Islam itself. So as an offshoot of that question, uh, one of the you know reasons which is provided for this punchline that Islam is a religion of peace is that the Quran itself is peaceful and it does not propagate violence against kafirs uh, in any manner. However, the hadiths which are used to interpret the Quran were written with a political uh, nature in mind, and hence the interpretation of Quran becomes violent, but not the Quran itself. So could you perhaps explain to us with your vast knowledge and your research, how does that really work? Here again, this argument can only be made among people who aren't familiar with what's in the Quran. And of course, not, uh, Muslims know that most non-Muslims have not read and never will read the Quran. And so they use these facile and shallow arguments because they are relying on the ignorance of the kuffar. In this case, it's very clear that while the Hadith are indeed bloodthirsty and do call for warfare against unbelievers, these ideas do not originate in the Hadith. They are just as much in the Quran. The Quran says, kill them wherever you find them. That's chapter 2, verse 191, chapter 4, verse 89, and then chapter 9, 5 says, Kill the polytheists wherever you find them, the mushrikeen, those who associate partners with the law. Then uh, chapter 9, verse 29 says, fight against those who uh, do not obey Allah and his messenger and do not forbid what he has forbidden, even if they are of the people of the book, until they pay the jizya, the tax, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. This is 929. Chapter 47, verse 4 says, when you meet the unbelievers, strike the necks. Chapter 8, verse 12 says, I will strike terror in the hearts of the unbelievers, therefore strike their necks and strike off their fingertips. These are not peaceful exhortations. You can't cut off somebody's, cut someone's neck in a peaceful manner. It's ridiculous, but Muslims are counting on, Islamic apologists are counting on our ignorance of the text. And there are many, many other uh, aspects of this. For example, chapter 8 of the Quran is called Al-Anfal, the spoils of war. Now then, Muslims will come and tell us that jihad is a spiritual struggle within the soul to better oneself. But 
the spoils of war in the spoils of war chapter in chapter eight verse 41 it, it it specifies that a fifth of the spoils have to be given to muhammad that muhammad gets 20 percent or the islamic state after the death of muhammad gets 20 percent of what the islamic warrior wins from the unbelievers well there's no spoils of war in a spiritual struggle so it's very clear that the quran is envisioning hot warfare, kinetic warfare against unbelievers, and not speaking metaphorically. Uh, but people don't read it, so they don't know. So interestingly, I was reading one of your articles where you had defended uh, Ms. Geller, uh, who, you know, uh, in The Guardian. And in that, you had made a very interesting distinction between uh, radical Islam and a radical Muslim. Uh, sorry, moderate Islam and moderate Muslim. You had said that the concept of moderate Islam does not exist. However, a moderate Muslim can. Yes. Uh, but when we, you know, listen to the believers, you know, or adherents of Islam, or even polytheists, or you know, Hindus and Christians who have their sympathies with Islam and Muslims they tend to say that there are two versions of Islam. One is the radical Islam and one is moderate Islam. So uh, while I understand where you're coming from when you say that a Muslim can be radical or moderate in the sense that he can be born into the Muslim faith but reject the violence that the religion itself propagates, can you explain to us what the concept of moderate Islam could be? I mean, I know you're saying that no such form exists, but for the sake of our uh, viewers and for the sake of everybody who's going to watch this video and call both of us Islamophobic, could you explain that concept to us, please? Certainly. You know, uh, this again relies on the ignorance of the people who are hearing these arguments because moderate Islam would be, most people assume that there is a moderate Islam that teaches coexistence and tolerance and peace that there is a form of Islam or a sect or a particular school of thought or school of jurisprudence that teaches that Muslims must live with non-Muslims as equals in a society that does not establish Islamic law. There is no form of Islam that teaches this. There is no school of jurisprudence. There is no tradition. There is no sect. People say, oh, the Sufis, they teach this. No, they don't. The Sufis may spend their time praying and spiritualize the concept of jihad, but the reality is that they also have been leaders of the jihad in Chechnya for centuries. And there are many Sufi leaders around the world who are very clear in the necessity to wage violent jihad warfare against unbelievers. So uh, there is actually no form of Islam among all the different sects and schools of jurisprudence that teaches this idea of a moderate Islam that most uh, non-Muslim politicians and media figures take for granted as existing. What they are confusing is moderate Islam with moderate Muslims. There are many, many Muslims who just are Muslims by virtue of their birth. They live as Muslims. Uh, they may go to uh, the mosque on Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha, but otherwise they're not observant. They uh, don't pray, they don't go to the mosque five times a day, and so on. These people are not going to wage jihad against unbelievers, but they do not represent a school of thought within Islam any more than in Christianity, Jesus said, love your enemies. There, there are many, many Christians who don't love their enemies. This doesn't change what the teaching is, but there are certain, it's undeniable that there are Christian believers who don't follow the teaching. Islam teaches warfare against unbelievers. There are many, many Muslims who don't uh, pay any attention to that, and that's great, but it doesn't change the teaching. That actually uh, sums up what you were trying to say in the article beautifully, and uh, it's, I think, going to help all of us uh, at least argue our side better, because these are punchlines which are thrown internationally, not just uh, back at home in India. But I think every adherent of Islam and every individual who has their sympathies with Islam and Muslims do tend to uh, throw these lines at us. That actually gets me beautifully to my third point. A lot of people say that all religions actually 
sort of lay the path for self-realization and all religions are the same whether it's Christianity, Islam or Hinduism or Judaism. Uh, they do say that the interpretations of these religions can be different. For example, uh, as far as Christianity is concerned, you can't call it a 100% peaceful religion because it does have a history of crusades, etc. There has been violence that has been associated with Christianity as well. Similarly, as far as Islam is concerned, it's a religion and a spiritual journey for a person to experience the higher power. However, uh, it is sort of abused by a lot of people to use for their political means. Uh, a lot of people also say that about Hinduism, though I will not comment on it because, of course, I am biased towards Hinduism. So I will reserve my comments on that. And the same is said about Judaism. So the punchline is that all religions are the same and all religions at some point of time or the other has been involved in religious violence or violence on the whole. So why is it that people like you or people uh, like me in a far smaller scale would pick only Islam to criticize as a religion that propagates hate and violence? And why not, the, you know, why is the focus not on Christianity or Judaism or Hinduism? There's no doubt that there have been believers in every religion who have committed acts of violence. There's even no doubt that believers in every religion have committed acts of violence in the name of the religion. But there's only one religion that actually teaches that these things are good and meritorious actions to undertake that are pleasing to the deity. And that's the difference. That's why we talk about Islam. Also, there is a shared morality among all the religions. There are, of course, individual differences, and I don't mean to minimize them at all. But if you look at the general moral precepts of all the major religions, they are all in agreement in general that it is not good to murder, it is not good to steal, it's not good to rape so on and so on. And then there's one that says it's okay to do all those things if you are a believer doing them to unbelievers. And that's very different. That's nothing that's taught in any other religion. There's nothing like that. And so while it's certainly true that, that all believers, because human nature is what's all the same, not all religions. All the religions are quite different from one another as far as I've been able to tell in my own study. But human nature is always the same. And people can be very magnanimous and loving and kind, and people can be brutal and irrational and violent. And they can find all kinds of justifications for doing that. But Islam is unique in sanctifying all that bad behavior and saying that that is actually the behavior that one should inculcate in one's children. That's the kind of behavior that we want to see more of in the world. No other religion teaches that. So I was when I was reading through uh, your writings, you had also said that you concede. No, I, I think it was one of your interviews. You said you had you concede that a lot of Muslims do not understand or speak Arabic. And since the Quran itself is in Arabic, you're willing to concede that a lot of Muslims or adherents of Islam do not even understand half the things which are written in the Quran. Now, if we assume that to be true, how do we explain the level of radicalization that we see specifically in the Muslim community? So what would you say are the modes which are used in modern India to radicalize Muslims, even though a large portion of Muslims do not speak or understand Arabic? So they aren't exactly conversant with exactly what is written in the Quran. Sure. I, uh, I never really thought of that as a concession. Uh, it's just a, an observation. It's just a fact. Uh, most Muslims around the world are not native speakers of Arabic. Obviously, the, in terms of population, the largest Muslim country in the world is Indonesia. Second is India, which is not even a Muslim country, but in the Indian Muslim population is the second largest Muslim population in, in the world. Then you have also Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, not Arab countries, and they don't, do not speak Arabic as natives. In Pakistan, in the madrasas, the little children, the little boys anyway, they memorize the Quran and they don't have the slightest idea what it's saying. 
they just are memorizing all these Arabic syllables. And so where does the radicalization come from? From the mosques and the madrasas themselves. You'll notice that a lot of the riots that we have seen in India, Pakistan, and elsewhere, they start on Friday afternoon. And that's no accident. They start on Friday afternoon because Friday is the day for the khutbah, for the sermon. And the Muslims go to mosque, they hear the sermon, and the sermon tells them that the unbelievers are doing these terrible things to the Muslims and they have to retaliate. And so they come out and they start to do violence and torch homes and, and attack innocent people and so on because they've been told that Allah wants them to do this. And they've been told by people that they trust. So it's certainly true that there's an abundance of justification for violence within the Quran and Sunnah. But then the Quran and Sunnah don't have to be understood by every individual Muslim. I doubt that when I see those photographs of the raging mobs in Pakistan, they don't. I, I would doubt that any of them have any idea what's in the Quran, even when they're holding it up and pointing to it and so on. They, they probably only have the vaguest idea of what it actually says but they know that the religious teachers that they trust know what it says, and they tell them that this is what Allah wants them to do and how they will get to Jannah, to paradise, so they do it. That, you know, since you've mentioned India, uh, in your book, The History of Jihad, you there was a passage where you wrote that after occupying so much land in the rest of the world, it took... Uh, jihadis almost over 500 years to find footing in India. And you said that their conversion efforts were thwarted mainly because of the size of the population that India had. And since they could not convert the large masks of people that India had to offer, they settled for the jizya, which means that kafirs have to uh, pay an additional tax to the Muslim rulers. Now, I would like to understand that, you know, Islam and Muslim rulers took over 500 years to find their footing in India. Why do you think that is? And the, was the resistance stronger than that in the rest of the uh, world, for example, Europe? Or do you think it was just a number game where Hindus won because they had numbers in their favor? A little bit of both. Uh, the resistance was certainly strong in Europe because we see that India along with Israel and Spain, are really the only places where the jihad has ever suffered losses and been rolled back from territory it controlled. And Spain, they, they fought for 700 years to drive the jihadis out. Eastern Europe also had been conquered by the Ottomans, but there was fierce resistance, and the, uh, the Ottoman armies were stopped on September 11, 1683, while besieging Vienna and never were able to get farther than Vienna, and ultimately lost their Eastern European holdings, although there are considerable numbers of Muslims there to this day, just as there are in India. And in India, it's the same thing. There was, uh, I think, fierce resistance in both places, and that comes from having uh, belief systems and a culture that the people understand and value enough that they will fight for and they'll die for. Of course, the Persians had a great culture and history uh, as well, uh, but they were overwhelmed uh, for a variety of reasons. I think one of the big differences is that India is indeed much uh, vaster than Persia. And so uh, these things we could discuss for hours, really. There are a great many aspects to them, but also there is the fact that the, the choice of the jizya was not originally given, which just made things more difficult for the Muslim conquerors or would-be conquerors in India. The jizya in the Quran is specified for the people of the book. The people of the book are those who are recognized to have another religion that is legitimately from Allah, but they are considered to have tampered with their scriptures in an illegitimate manner and rendered them useless. And so they have to be punished by law and subjugated under the rule of the Muslims, but they can still continue to practice their ancestral religions. And that's Judaism, Christianity, and the Zoroastrianism of Persia. I think that may have made it actually easier for some of the 
people, not all of them, because as I say, there was certainly strong resistance in some areas, but some of the Europeans and some of the Persians probably found it easier to take the option of submitting. They knew that they were facing a relentless and, and ruthless military foe that they might not be able to overcome, but they could still practice their religions in this diminished form. They opted for that. Now in India, originally that was not an option because the Hindus were not considered people of the book, which meant that it was just convert to Islam or die for them. And so the, the, without the option of submitting, I think that in a certain sense posed an, uh, the appearance, the, the illusion of an easy way out, they fought all the more tenaciously. And that's why ultimately that status of the people of the book was extended to the Hindus as well. But that's one of the primary reasons why I think they did not achieve so much success at the beginning. So do you think this could also be because, uh, and I'm playing the devil's advocate here, Christianity is generally considered closer to Islam than Hinduism because uh, both are monotheistic relation, uh, uh, religions, while Hindu, Hinduism is completely the opposite and it becomes a polytheistic relation. Uh, I keep saying relationship for some reason. It becomes a polytheistic uh, religion. So do you think the reason why perhaps India fought harder was because the differences between Hinduism and Islam were so vast as compared to Christianity and Islam, which is actually a religion closer to Islam than Hinduism? It's a good point. I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, you are one of the now one of the few people, there are probably fewer than five, who have ever asked me a question that I had never considered before. And so I congratulate you. Uh, I would say immediately, my, my immediate answer, and I haven't obviously reflected on this very much, is that, uh, yeah, the uh, Quran presents itself as the completion and correction of Christianity. I don't think this ever had much appeal among Christians, but it is something that Muslim uh, apologists and preachers use to this day in appealing to Christians. They say, look, Jesus is a Muslim prophet. We revere the mother of Jesus. We uh, uh, says to obey the gospel, although that's a dead letter, but the Quran does say that. And uh, thus, you, we acknowledge Jesus. You should acknowledge Muhammad. I don't know if they fool very many people with this, but it is certainly possible. Whereas in when you come to Hinduism, it's completely separate and alien tradition. Although some people have suggested that some of the particular uh, observances of the Hajj, the Muslim pilgrimage, actually derive from Hinduism, but that's another story. Uh, that's something certainly that certainly that no Muslims would acknowledge. And so uh, I think that's possible on the face of it. On the other hand, there were Christians. Uh, all over the world, even to this day, who are fighting very strongly against jihad and Islamization. So it's not as if uh, you could say that Christians were generally supine in the face of this threat. Uh, Europe now has collapsed entirely into submission, and that's uh, that coincides with its discarding of Christianity. When Europe was Christian, it fought against the jihadis. Now it's bringing them in. So since we are on the subject of Christianity, I'll ask you another question and then we can go back uh, to Islam. And it's a little connected. As a Hindu and in India specifically for the Hindu community, uh, the threat of conversion comes from uh, Christianity as well as Islam. Uh, Islam aims to convert and they do so by very many ways as you know, you are an authority uh, more than I can ever be. However, in India, the, the threat of conversion also emanates from Christianity. We see the northeast part of India, which has completely uh, been Christianized because of the conversion of Hindus. In fact, there are Christian groups and the church, which has been uh, complicit in promoting violence and Maoism simply to subjugate the Hindu uh, population. Maoism? Uh, Maoism is extreme leftism, nutalism. I know what it is. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so that, 
And uh, even during the anti-CAA protests, I mean, I'm sure you're aware that CAA but, extended refuge not just to persecuted Hindus from Islamic nations, but also to persecuted Christians. Yes. However, there were sections of the church which supported the Islamists and the jihadists in opposing CAA. Now, could you, um, you know, for the Indian uh, population and especially for the Hindu community, could you explain uh, how to deal with the threat of conversion that comes both from Islam and Christianity? And how is this threat really different? Uh, different? So what is different between how Islam converts and how Christianity converts? Well, that's the really the crux of the issue. Uh, if you object to the preaching of any other religious ideas, that's one thing. But certainly Christianity and Islam are missionary faiths, and so they are going to be preaching. And as a Christian myself, I cannot and will not say that I object to the preaching in principle, but I object to any kind of coercion or inducement, or and certainly to any violence. The difference between the Christians and the Muslims, theoretically, theoretically, that is, the, I'm sure there are Christians who abuse this, uh, but in any case, the difference is this. The Christians will knock on your door and ask you to come to their church and talk to you about their faith. And then you can tell them, I'm not interested, thank you, and close the door and they'll go away. The Muslims will knock on your door and ask you to come to their mosque and tell you about Muhammad and Allah. And if you tell them you're not interested, they will come back and burn your house down. And this is the difference. And this is, the, the, I'm putting it in kind of a flippant way, but it's a very serious point. There is no warrant in Christianity for any kind of forced conversion or coercion of converts in any, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, Christianity teaches the free conscience. And this is something that is affirmed by the major sects and uh, denominations that people uh, must not be coerced in their belief. But Islam teaches just the opposite. Muhammad says, when you meet the unbelievers, invite them to accept Islam. If they accept it, then that's the end of the matter. But if they refuse, then invite them to pay the jizya. And if they refuse that, then fight them. Seek Allah's help and fight them. So they're, they're saying that you invite the non-Muslims to convert. If they convert, all good. If they don't convert, ask them to submit under the rule of Islamic law, denied all the basic rights that most people enjoy. And if they refuse that, then go to war with them. So it is ultimately coercive at its core that you either have to convert or you have to submit to their rule or you have to die. Whereas Christianity doesn't teach anything like that. Now, uh, that being said, I have seen forced conversion stories, stories of people being paid and so on, and I uh, deplore and denounce all that, absolutely. Actually, uh, you know, that would, uh, so I have to say this, why do you think that there were Christians in India, uh, church sanctioned, who allied with the Islamists as far as the Citizenship Amendment Act was concerned? Because that is a concern which baffles most people, considering it did give refuge to persecuted Christians from Islamic nations as well. Do you know who these groups were? Can you give me any names? Because that might help me help me understand what was happening there. Because um, I'm not aware of them. I'm not denying it. I'm sure there were Christians who did this. Hmm. But I can just say in general, was, was it the Catholic Church? Yes, factions of the Catholic Church. Well, that, that makes sense then, because the Catholic Church is pursuing dialogue with the Muslims. Now, this is an entirely spurious, useless exercise, but it inhibits Catholics from speaking out about the uh, persecution of Christians in Muslim lands. For example, I was asked in uh, 2013 to speak in a, uh, at a Catholic group, and then the local bishop actually canceled my appearance and he issued a statement saying that if I came and spoke about radical Muslims and their persecution of Christians, it would harm the wonderful dialogue that he was having with the Muslim community. And I think, okay, several things about this. One is, what good is a dialogue 
if you cannot discuss unpleasant matters. If Muslims are persecuting Christians and you're having dialogue with Muslims, but you can't mention the persecution of Christians in the dialogue, then what's the point of it? If it doesn't stop any Christian from being persecuted, what's the point of it? And yet the Catholic Church, as well as really the, the, the other churches, are for the most part pursuing this, thinking that somehow they're going to come to some agreement with some Muslim leader that's going to lead to the end of jihad. It's, it's ridiculous and stupid, and it comes from an ignorance of the basis of jihad doctrine. It comes from not knowing that jihad is taught in the Quran and Sunnah, and that they're not going to negotiate the Quran away. It's, it's inconceivable, but that's, that's no doubt why they opposed it, because it would point up a persecution that they would prefer to ignore. They have betrayed the, per, the Christians who are persecuted in Pakistan and Afghanistan and uh, the other one, Burma. Bangladesh. Bangladesh, not Burma. Thank you. <laughs> it's okay. I, I It can get confusing. Uh, I'm getting now, old, uh, old and senile. Oh, please don't. We need you for at least the next few uh, decades well, <laughs> to pull us out of this. So <clears throat> interestingly, um, you also made a statement about uh, the criticism to Islam by ex-Muslims. And uh, you said that ex-Muslims who ally with the left are less inclined to uh, ally with you, who, you know, a non-Muslim who criticizes Islam, as opposed to ex-Muslims who ally with uh, the so-called right, for the, you know, for the want of a better word. So what I would like to understand is what drives this nexus between the left and uh, Islamists? Because the left has historically claimed that they are atheists, that they do not believe in any sort of higher power or God. However, they are far more interested and far more inclined to allying with Islamists. And we've seen this in India. I mean, uh, when the Delhi riots 2020 happened, we saw the entire left uh, circuit and the entire left ecosystem that was engaged in shielding uh, the jihadis and ensuring that the blame was put on the Hindus and not the jihadis. So what do you think explains this sort of nexus and incestuous relationship between the left and the jihadis? On that, I can really only speak about the West. But in the West, it's very clear that these ex-Muslims have a new religion and it's leftism. And that's why they oppose me because I support the United States. I support free societies. I support the idea of a constitutional republic, whereas the left is authoritarian, totalitarian, wants to destroy the freedom of speech, uh, have total control over the human being. Leftists claim this is not true, but every far left regime that has ever existed on the planet has been authoritarian, dehumanizing, enslaving its own people, just denying any political dissent, violent, all these things. And uh, there's, a, there's a motto on the front of Front Page magazine where I write frequently that says inside every progressive is a totalitarian screaming to get out. And I think uh, not only is that true, but they're getting out now. It's, it's becoming clearer with these riots we're seeing in Portland and Seattle and now in Wisconsin and so on. Anyway, the, uh, the, the point is they share the anti-Americanism. They share the hatred of Western civilization. They share the desire to destroy those things and to replace them with a new uh, world order, which the left envisions as Marxist and which the Muslims envision as Sharia. And there's no incompatibility between the two because they're both authoritarian and violent and coercive. And so they get along great. Islam has never had any problem coexisting with authoritarian repressive regimes. It's actually never had any uh, de democratic tradition within Islam. Only Turkey, and Turkey is now throwing its democratic tradition away. Other than that, every Islamic state has been an authoritarian state. And every Marxist state, every far left state has been an authoritarian state. So 
they are blood brothers because they're both tyrants and opponents of human rights and human freedom. It's honestly very interesting that you would say that because uh, in the Delhi riots 2020, we saw that uh, the jihadis wanted to burn the Indian constitution. They were against the very idea of India. <clears throat> we heard slogans like Jinnah Wali Azadi, which essentially means they want freedom on the lines of what Jinnah, Muhammad Ali Jinnah created, which is demanding for a creation of a separate Islamic nation. So it seems to me that, you know, when you talk about the West, you're saying that the left is against the very idea that Americans fought to preserve. And so are the Islamists. And in India, it seems pretty much the same thing. So mm -hmm. it would appear to me that you're saying that left is uh, neo-Islamism. If uh, I mean, we should just start calling it neo-Islamism Islamism instead of leftism now. Well, they, they, they coexist so well. Another thing I forgot to mention is that they're internationalists. When you note, noted that they are against the very idea of India, that's consistent with Islamic internationalism, that your loyalty is to the ummah around the world, the global Islamic community, not to any nation state. And you look at Pakistan that Jinnah founded, and it's, it's the pure land, Pak, right? It's, it's not any particular nationality. It's the land of the of the pure Muslims. So theoretically, it could be an international order that extends over the world. I'm not saying that Pakistan wants to control the world. I'm talking about Islamic internationalism. And it's the same thing, that they believe it transcends all nationality in exactly the same way that Marxist internationalists believe that their commitment to Marxism, to the international proletariat, transcends all national boundaries and allegiances. Which is why we see Indian left ally beautifully with China, uh, which is not supposed to be a friendly nation to India uh, per se. So do you think the threat of Islamism is far greater when a nation declares itself secular? Uh, when the nation says that the con constitutionally and uh, uh, you know democratically they are going to have no state religion and the state is going to be a secular nation, which keeps equidistance from all religions. Do you think such a nation, and of course, I'm talking with reference to India, but you can uh, you know, talk on a broader theoretical level. Do you think a secular nation, which is not either a Hindu state or a Christian state, are more vulnerable to the threat of jihadism? Countered in quite a long time. This we should do this again. <laughs> The, uh, the difficulty is this. There are several aspects to the question. One is, I'm against any kind of establishment of a religion in a state. On the other hand, I'm speaking about the United States of America, which is the only place I've ever lived. I um, could not possibly speak about India. And so speaking only about the United States of America, I understand that there are a number of people who have irreconcilable worldviews that there are people who uh, believe in one thing and other people who believe that that same thing is anathema, is a terrible thing to believe, and so on. And this is why the framers of the US Constitution uh, put in that there would be no established religion, because they were saying that no one group will gain hegemony over the others. We will all coexist peacefully. Now, that only depends on you having a religion that allows for you to coexist peacefully. In Islam, it does not provide for that. The framers of the Constitution uh, did not have in mind the idea of an authoritarian, violent, supre supremacist, aggressive, and expansionist religion. And it would seem to me that that's a very grave problem because then people say, oh, so you're against the First Amendment, you're against the freedom of religion for Muslims? No, but we need to understand that Islam has elements that are political, as well as supremacist, aggressive, violent, expansionist, and hegemonic. And consequently, those political aspects are at variance with and contradiction with the idea of uh, a free freedom of religion in which there's, there's no establishment, because they will try to establish their religion. And if we believe in non-establishment, we have to resist that. Now, there are many other aspects to this as well. And pardon me for going on if I'm going on too long. 
One other is that nature abhors a vacuum. And that, as I pointed out before, when Europe was Christian, it fought against the jihadis. But when Europe discarded its Christianity, suddenly it's inviting in uh, Muslims among whom are jihadis without any kind of uh, attempt to prevent the jihadis from entering. And many, many people in the West are converting to Islam because there's a spiritual vacuum created by the discarding of Christianity. And people are looking for some meaning and purpose in their lives, and they see this force that is very sure of itself, very self-confident, and it's appealing to them. Even though it represents uh, a force that has been arrayed against everything that made Western civilization great, and so while I'm against a religious establishment, at the same time, I understand that our current lack of a religious establishment is contributing to our weakness. And so these things are uh, these things I have not been able to resolve at this point. And uh, when it comes to India, I suspect it's much the same situation as far as I've been able to observe. And obviously, I keep up as much as I can. It's, uh, in a certain sense, the same kind of situation in that most of the people who are secular are on the left and against preserving the values of the nation and the integrity of the nation itself. Whereas the people who are not secular, they are willing to defend India as such. And so <clears throat> sympathy is with them. Uh, at the same time, it's partly because of my own study of political Islam that I don't want establishment. You know, you noted before that Christians have been violent and so on. There's a big difference between Christianity and Islam in that Christianity does not teach violence in its core texts, and Islam does. But Christianity was violent when it was a state, when it was an, when, when, when there were state authorities who could, who could uh, uh, enforce Christian tenets. And I'm against that. I'm against all kinds, all kinds of coercion. But then that leads us back to the original dilemma that, okay, so you don't have it, and then the state is not strong enough to withstand those who are calling for the Islamic state. So this is, of course, a dilemma. I would just like to put a disclaimer here that India, Bharat, and I, you know, because India is more of a country which was born after political boundaries were drawn. But Hindustan, Bharat, uh, which was uh, the ancient Hindu civilization, suffered Islamic onslaught for over 800 years. And uh, when we wanted the Britishers to leave and when the partition happened, foolishly enough, our political um, ancestors uh, decided that we did not, we wanted to stay secular and not really uh, turn India or ensure that when a Muslim state is being carved out of India, the rest of India remains a Hindu state, for example. Now, in India, Hinduism has never been a missionary uh, re uh, religion, uh, so to speak. And Hinduism has never been the aggressor, has never initiated violence on any other community unless it was attacked first. So. Um, in my view, of course, uh, our political ancestors were slightly foolish when the partition was happening because India cannot claim that it had no prior knowledge of what radical Islamism and jihadism can do to a country and what jihadism does to Hindus. So we have prior knowledge. We have over 800, 900 years worth of knowledge. So India was foolish in that respect, but I'm not going to let go that easily, uh, Mr. Spencer. So you're saying that when Christianity was predominant in Europe, they were far more motivated and equipped to fight jihadism. Now, even if Christianity is a missionary state, if it was the state religion, for example, it would be a stated uh, sort of law that the state follows Christianity. And then there would obviously be uh, certain provisions which would allow for protection of minorities or protection of people who follow other religions. However, the state would be uh, more motivated to fight the threat of jihadism. And I think we can all agree that jihad is one of the foremost threats that we face today globally. Similarly, if India 
was at the time of partition declared a Hindu state, I can extend that argument and say that the people would be far more motivated and the state would be far more motivated to fight the threat of jihadism because there would be no room, there would be no wriggle room to say, oh, we are secular. So we need to uh, embrace, understand, forgive, you know, put reliance on brotherhood and uh, agreements and stuff like that. For example, you said that the Catholic Church is now trying to talk to jihadis and talk to Muslim leaders. And uh, <clears throat> I can easily say that there are a lot of Indian political leaders who follow the Hindu faith, but are trying the same in their own way. So there are parallels there. So will you concede that if the state religion of Europe was Christianity, and if as an extension of that, the straight state religion of India was Hinduism, the states would be far more motivated to fight the threat of jihadism because the constitution itself would not give them the wriggle room to get out of it. Yes, certainly. Absolutely. Uh, uh, that's actually uh, probably not very well, but the point I was trying to make before, that when Christianity was indeed the religion of Europe, then they fought the jihadis, and they don't now, because in large part because they do not see religion even as important enough, and they do not realize how important it is to the jihadis, they don't see that they need any need to resist anything, and they assume that the jihadis will come to Europe and become uh, secular fellow citizens, which of course has no basis in reality. India has a tremendous dilemma because you have Pakistan that was carved out of it in 1948 and constituted as a Muslim state and became a Sharia state later. And so Muslims have the identity of being citizens of Pakistan and the Muslims in India can look to Pakistan as the Islamic state that is rightfully they are rightfully part of. And it is a draw, a drag on their allegiance to India itself, and a a reminder that their primary allegiance is to the global Ummah. And Hindus were not given anything corresponding to that. You have on the one side you have the Islamic identity, which is a draw for Muslims in India, and on the other side you have nothing because of secularism. So maybe that is the way forward. That. Uh, the states of the West, the nations of the West need to understand that or need to acknowledge that they have a Christian heritage and Christian tradition, and they need to acknowledge that on an official level, which is not to say persecuting or denying rights to non-Christians in any way, shape, or form, uh, but just that they understand that they have a Christian identity, which Europe has very energetically denied up to now, uh, and that on that basis they would fight to maintain it rather than not have any identity at all, but just be a grab bag of things of various people who happen to live there. And thus the, uh, the uh, jihadis can come in wholesale and nobody says, says a word. So we need faiths to fight faith. Yeah, it, it does seem reasonable. You know, uh, I think that's a very compelling argument that, uh, it's, it's problematic in so many ways because it's very hard now after 50, 60 years to, I mean, maybe there'll be some tremendous revival of Christianity, but most of the time in human history, when a culture, when a society has discarded a religion, they don't go back to that one. They find something else. And that's the great opportunity that Islam has in the West today. So what I hear is India is at a very precarious and momentous time in its existence where it either chooses to abandon its roots and go uh, and get Islamized as Europe is in fact currently going through that process. In fact, a lot of people in India have started calling London, Londonistan mm -hmm. because uh, you, know, you can barely differentiate between uh, what it used to be I mean, you can differentiate between what it used to be and what it's turning out to be with the influx of uh, jihadis. I was in uh, London in 2009. This is obviously before I was banned. And I took a long walk through the city. I did what any tourist in London do does. I visited the mosques. And I walked through East London, which is uh, 
predominantly Muslim. And for, for block after block after block, there was no sign you were in London. Everything was Islamic. Everything was Pakistani culture. There was no indication whatsoever, except that uh, every, all the signs were, well, not even all the signs were in English. Uh, and that would be the same case in Pakistan anyway. So it, it was probably this, much the same as walking through Karachi. Wow, that's, uh, and that's 2009. We're almost uh, 11 years into, uh, you know, the present status. And I'm sure it's become worse. In fact, yeah. that gets me to the grooming gang question uh, that I had. Now, in UK, we've seen a lot of trials where uh, grooming gang were caught. And they are predominantly Muslims. And they are predominantly, I mean, a lot of them are actually from Pakistan, even though I will not make that claim because I don't have the exact statistics. But from the cases that I've followed, a lot of them are from Pakistan and they're predominantly, uh, you know, followers of Islam. Um, there is there have also been cases where the state has gone extremely uh, soft on these grooming gangs, even when there were cases of the Harush that came up. Now, Considering that having a state religion, having faith to fight faith, is something that is not an immediate solution in any country, what do you think is the solution to fight this rampant jihadism? Because when we have grooming gangs in UK, I can tell you that in India we have something called love jihad, which is uh, you know denied by the left and the secularists and all of those. But it is a very real threat where there are Muslim men who are radicalized and they brainwash Hindu and Christian girls to abandon their faith and marry them after they convert to Islam. This is what's happening in India and this is uh, an accepted tool in Pakistan. That's how these little girls from Hindu, Sikh, Christian, uh, Christianity are being targeted in Pakistan. Considering faith fighting faith does not seem like an immediate solution, at least. Uh, what do you think is a solution to this? A realistic solution? Regain the will to live. Uh, Britain has lost the will to live. Britain is committing suicide. It is destroying itself as a, as a nation. Uh, the idea that tens of thousands, maybe even more, uh, British girls were victimized by these gangs and people did nothing. Police were indifferent and officials were afraid of being charged with racism and Islamophobia. And so they let these gangs roam free and do nothing and, and, and do whatever they wanted for years. That's not a that's not a society that is healthy. That's a society that is dying. And yes, they were mostly Pakistani, but not all. Some were Somali. Some were from other Muslim countries. They were overwhelmingly Muslim. Some were uh, British converts to Islam. But they were all motivated by the teachings of the Quran concerning taking the captives of the right hand and using them as sex slaves. Uh, this is something that is sanctioned in the Quran. It's very clear that they are uh, that this is allowed. And some of the rapists themselves explained to the girls that they were kept taking captive that this was something allowed in the Quran. But it was because of British officials' unwillingness or fear to confront their Muslim communities that this thing went on for so long. So uh, our discussion about faith needing to be, needing faith to counter faith is, is fascinating and worth pursuing. But I don't know that it is in play in this question in particular because what, what Britain needs to do in this case is simply enforce its laws. It has laws against rape. It has laws against uh, sex slavery and prostitution and human trafficking. And it did not enforce these laws because it did not have the will to confront the Muslims in Britain. That's what has to be fixed. And if that were uh, fixed, I, I, I believe secular people could do that. And if they did that, then they would go along. Or maybe it's a false hope, but uh, maybe it's because they're secular really? that they let this happen. You, you, may, you may be right. I don't know. I mean, certainly we have the fact of it and the fact that nothing was done and the fact that it's still being covered up in Britain. Maybe that does go directly to Britain's crisis of faith 
and loss of its own identity and self value, uh, value of itself and its own heritage. Uh, so maybe that's it. When the British were sure of themselves and confident, then they they conquered practically half the world. And I'm not sure I'm behind that either. You know, there, there needs to well, be a- certainly aren't in India, <laughs> having faced yeah. the onslaught of their colonialism. Exactly. So uh, there needs to be some happy medium that's found where uh, these states recover their own values, but not in the sense that they end up denying anybody else's rights. I'll ask you the last question before we can take a, a few audience questions as well. It's a popular belief that uh, jihadism was on the rise when the demand for oil was on the rise. And, uh, you know, when our dependence on oil declines, violent Islam jihadism is also going to be on the decline. However, uh, to my memory, please correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not really uh, proficient in history. But to my memory, jihadism has never, ever really been on the decline. Uh, so what gives us hope that once dependency on oil reduces, jihadism will reduce too? Well, there will be an immediate difficulty that they'll have in resources. I mean, we see it with the Islamic Republic of Iran. When Obama gave Iran billions, then Hezbollah and the other jihad groups that Iran finances, they suddenly had a lot of money which meant they were able to do uh, a lot of things they would not have done otherwise. But then when Trump ended the United States cooperation with the Iran deal and replaced some sanctions, then suddenly the jihad groups that Iran is supporting are not as wealthy anymore. Now you carry that out to a large scale. When the jihadis have money, then they, they, they work. And when they don't, they haven't. But we would be naive to think that the end of the age of oil dependency will mean the end of jihad. Because, uh, well, in my book, The History of Jihad, it shows jihad has been a constant of 1400 years, long before petroleum became valuable to anyone. And jihad always was pursued against non-Muslims whenever Muslims had the resources to do it, which is most of the time. When the Ottoman Empire went into decline, there was a period in which there was not a whole lot of jihad activity in the West. It was not ended completely, but there was less of it. And that led a lot of Western analysts to think, oh, jihad is a thing of the past, and now they've reformed and are peaceful, which led to the immigration policies that have renewed jihad today. Because jihad was never actually reformed or rejected. It was just a matter of the Ottoman Empire not having the resources. The oil age, the age of oil will pass and something else will arise that will give some Muslims some wealth. And when some Muslims have wealth, they will give some of that wealth to the jihadis and the jihad will continue. As long as there are people who believe in Islam and Muhammad and the Quran, there will be jihad. So we're screwed. No, we just have to understand that there is no, uh, there's no end to this. There's no solution. The problem has no solution, but the problem can be managed. And, uh, you know, when the British actually had control in India, they dealt with the uh, Hindus and the Muslims, but the Muslims kept waging jihad against them and yeah. carrying out massacres. And so at a certain point early in the 19th century, the British stopped dealing with the Muslims and only dealt with the Hindus. And the Hindu communities grew more wealthy. I am not justifying the British occupation. I'm no, just... Yeah. I'm speaking about the fact that the Muslims suffered economically because of their jihad and because the British had overwhelming strength. And so they were able to stop the Muslims from waging jihad, not completely, but to a great degree. And the Hindus prospered, the Muslims didn't, because the Hindus were not waging jihad and the Muslims were. So there's a lesson in that. And the lesson in that is that if we have overwhelming strength, not just militarily, but culturally and societally, then the jihad goes into the uh, into abeyance and is not such a prominent feature of our societies. If we look back in India in the 1950s, there wasn't jihad like there is today. Why is that? Because we were stronger against it. Than, and secularism in the Islamic world, 
was more in the ascendance than it is today. So that is the kind of uh, course we can pursue now and to try to recover that strength against the jihad and then it will go into eclipse again, but it will never be stamped out completely. All right. Uh, you know, we can carry on this conversation for hours together, but I think we should take some audience questions now. Um, OK, that's not a question. It is obvious that the toxic left plus Islam combo poses great danger to free ways of life, yet democracies around the world have refused to tackle this problem head on. I think that's, we've discussed this at length, but if you'd like yeah. to add something, please. Just one thing, and, and that is that the democracies of the world, for the most part today, with the notable exceptions of India and the United States during the Trump administration, are controlled by the left. And consequently, in Europe, they're democracies, but the left controls them. So, of course, they do nothing about the jihad. They are aiding and abetting it. And that's what they would like to do. That's the same thing that happened in the United States during the Obama administration, because he was on the left. He so enabled any, state, any government. So essentially, any government which is sympathetic towards the left or sympathetic towards communism is going to aid in a bad jihadism. No doubt. I actually have one important question. Would India have been a very modern country if it weren't for Islam for 1400 years? There's no doubt that Islam has caused tremendous damage to India, catastrophic damage to India as well as to other countries. Uh, you cannot uh, be certain, of course, that nothing else would have happened. Nobody can know what would have happened in history if something else were different. Uh, but there's no doubt that Islam has been a devastating force for the entire world, not just in India. You know, I was in Israel a few years back and I was doing a tour. I was being a tourist. I was working, but I took a day to be a tourist. And I went to Caesarea, the ancient Roman city, the city of Caesar, Caesarea. And I went into the, uh, the tourist center and they had on the wall uh, the map of the city in Roman times. And then superimposed over it was the map of the city in Byzantine times. And then the map of the city in the time of the Arab conquest. And then the map of the city under the Turks. And then the map of the city under Israel. Each one of those showed a prosperous, thriving city, except for under the Arabs and the Turks. Oh, and the Crusaders were between the, uh, the Arab period and the Turkish period. And even under the Crusaders, the city was prospering, but not during the time of the Arabs and the Turks because Islam teaches a fatalism and a despising of human labor that uh, makes it such that there's no incentive. It's uh, human labor, manual labor in particular, is something that the non-Muslims do, like the sweepers in Pakistan, the Christians and so on. Uh, that this is, this is uh, beneath the dignity of the Muslims who are the best of peoples. And so there's no work ethic in Islam. There's no idea that work, human work is something that's good in itself. And so the societies don't prosper if they have no unbelievers to bleed. And so what you have is the recurring phenomenon in India as well as elsewhere of the non-Muslims being bled dry and then the country itself goes into decline because the Muslims are not generally working as much. They don't have the kind of work ethic that you see among non-Muslims elsewhere. So. Islam is a devastating cultural force. I've wanted to write a book about this, but uh, nobody wants to take it. It's for some reason, that's something that even it's too much for my publishers. But anyway, maybe well, later. So we can read it at least. That would, I hope to one day. Moving on, Nupur, please ask the guest the difference between pre and post Medina verses in the Quran. Yeah, there are two great divisions, the Meccan period and the Medinan period. Muhammad was in Mecca from 620 when he first became a prophet, to 610 rather, to 622. 610 to 622, he's in Mecca where he was born, and he's preaching tolerance. Then he moves to Medina in 622, and for the last 10 years of his life, from 622 to 632, he's preaching warfare against unbelievers. Now, there's a deception here, though. The tolerance that is taught, in, and then the, uh, 
I should say also that the part of the Quran was revealed in Mecca, and those are called the Meccan surahs, the Meccan chapters. And part of the Quran was revealed in Medina, the Medinan surahs. The Medinan ones are generally more violent. But the Meccan passages are often said that it teaches brotherhood and peace. They don't. They teach that the unbelievers are all going to be in hell, suffering forever. But they teach tolerance. They don't teach tolerance, however, for the non-Muslims. They teach tolerance for the Muslims. The idea of the Meccan verses is that the non-Muslims should be tolerant of the Muslims because the Muslims are a small force and the non-Muslims are larger and more powerful. And so the non-Muslims need to be tolerant of the Muslims. But then when the Muslims gain the upper hand, that's the Medinan passages, then they don't give tolerance to the non-Muslims. That's when the warfare kicks in. So a lot of people have a misunderstanding about this. The tolerance is only taught when the Muslims are weak and small in number, and then they're preaching tolerance for themselves. That is not tolerance for everybody else. This is an actually interesting question. I have read Robert, History of Jihad, a very good book. Question for Robert, when can we get Robert, Robert Spencer books in Hindi and in other Indian languages? I would love to do this. And I have pursued this. It's very complicated, unfortunately. I wish that we could just take care of it. But in the first place, I don't speak any languages that are spoken in India except English. So... I can't check to see if a, if a translation is, is reliable. I had a terrible experience with my book, Did Muhammad Exist, 10 years ago. I got it translated two different times into Arabic by people who cost a lot of money, but the translations were all wrong. Okay. Uh, one of them even had, it, had the title, Does Muhammad Exist, instead of Did Muhammad Exist, which is a completely different meaning. Anyway. Uh, I would need to be able to check the, the validity of the translation. That in, that's the first difficulty. The second difficulty is that I don't own the international rights. Unfortunately, when I sign a contract to get a book published, that's one of the things that the publisher keeps. This is a, pretty much a standard practice that the publisher owns the international rights. So anybody who wants to translate it has to deal with the publisher. The publisher does not want to deal with a well-meaning individual who wants to translate the book and put it out. The publisher wants to deal with another publisher who actually can put it out. Okay. And so if you're an individual who can speak the languages and get it into the language, that's not enough. You have to have a publisher as well. And then he will deal with my publisher. And then my pub, I'm not going to see any money about this. This isn't about getting rich, but the publisher wants some money for the rights and that also has been problematic with some of the people that we've uh, had negotiations with. I would love to do this. If you are know of a publisher in India who could do this, please get in touch with me at the email address director at jihadwatch.org. I will put you in touch with Bombardier Books, which published History of Jihad, and I hope we'll be able to work this out. So far, we have been in touch with several people, but nothing has come to fruition. I actually know somebody and I'll speak to you about that separately. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, if we draw a comparison between Ottoman Empire and Mughal Empire, both were barbaric, then why Muslims are huge in numbers in India as compared to Europe? Well, there are a lot of reasons for that. Really, you have to read the book, The History of Jihad, or just be familiar with the history of jihad in India. You know that you could argue that the, the Mughal Empire actually had more success than the Ottomans, at least in Europe. Uh, the Ottomans conquered Constantinople, but that really wasn't a great thing. Uh, I mean, it was a great thing. It was a world historical thing. It was a terrible tragedy. But Constant the Byzantine Empire, by the time the Ottomans conquered it, was just a city-state. It was just the city of Constantinople. And it had lost all its other holdings uh, over the centuries. The uh, Ottomans then conquered in Eastern Europe, but then they were stopped. And of course, they were stopped in India at various points as well, but they also conquered various empires, and not the Ottomans, of course, I mean the jihadis in India. They conquered various empires before that and were able to rule over a large portion of India. So in a certain sense, the situation is exactly the same. 
that the Muslims conquered the Ottomans in Eastern Europe and, and occupied that territory and Islamized it. And they did the same thing in the areas of India that they controlled. And so it's, uh, it's a matter of detail how it was different. But in both cases, the overall story was the same. I think we can end with this question that uh, you know I chuckled at. What would communists and jihadists do if they came to power? Fight amongst themselves or rule together? Fight amongst themselves. Look <laughs> at the Islamic Republic of Iran. That's the foremost example. Uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini, of course, wanted to establish an Islamic state, but the Tuda party was communist and they were allied with him. They, they wanted to help him bring down the Shah, so they brought down the Shah. And the Tuda party, the communists, thought they were going to be part of the new government. Instead, he put them in prison. It would be the same thing if they, con if they do conquer Europe, and I think they're on track now to conquer several countries in Europe then the leftists who enabled them will think that they'll be able to control them. Probably they will end up being controlled, but we'll see. I hope we don't see, but we probably will see this. Uh, which country has successfully fought off jihad? Israel? Spain. Sorry? India. I'm sorry? India. I think a lot of Indians and a lot of Hindus would disagree with that because we are facing the onslaught on a regular basis. But India was not... Uh, completely conquered and Islamized before. Yeah. And the, there's still a, a, a huge number of Hindus who will not accept Islamization. And so that's why I say India, because uh, during the time of the Mughal Empire uh, and, and the brutality of the rule of the Muslims at that, uh, in that, it would have been easy to think that they would have crushed all resistance. And they certainly tried, but they were not, weren't able to. And it's the same thing in Spain, as well as with the establishment of the modern state of Israel. So those are really the only examples in anywhere in the world of jihad being rolled back. I think we can take one last question and then we can end it. I've kept you for long enough. It's been um, a pleasure. Why jihad is not growing in East Asia like Japan and South Korea? So why is Japan and South Korea almost immune to jihadism? Japan and South Korea are not letting in other people in any significant numbers. And a lot of people would say, oh, that's terrible. That's racist. That's bigoted. Well, you call it whatever you want. And you may think whatever you wish to think about the immigration policies of Japan and South Korea. Uh, I know people who are Americans, who, who have American parents, who were born in Japan to two American parents, and they speak Japanese like natives, but they are tall and blonde and blue-eyed, and they don't look Japanese, and they will never be Japanese. The Japanese do not accept them, even though they are, that's their home and the only place they know. I'm not defending this, I'm just explaining. If you have Muslim, you'll have... If you think it's the solution, please defend it so we learn from it. Well, you know, uh, the immigration pro problem is very fraught with charges of racism and bigotry and so on. But you have to understand the fact that if you have Muslims, you're going to have jihadis. If you say we're going to keep out Muslims, then people are going to say you're racist and bigoted and Islamophobic and xenophobic. To a tremendous degree, these are weapons designed to intimidate you into not taking measures that would be for your self-defense. And ultimately, all the non-Muslim societies in the world are going to have to accept that they're going to have to make a choice. Are they going to accept Sharia and Islamization and submit to Islamic rule? Or are they going to say, no, there's going to be no more Sharia and no more spread of Islam in our countries. But there's no third way, because the jihadis, not all the Muslims, but the jihadis are always going to be working to spread Islam and impose Sharia. And there will always be jihadis as long as there are Muslims. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. It's been such an enlightening uh, discussion for almost an hour and a half now. I hope that we can have you back so we can perhaps discuss some of the more theological questions that ail Islam. Uh, today, I wanted to discuss the modern repercussions of Islam and what you thought were the reasons for it. And uh, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I think we are all uh, more enlightened and more educated as far as jihadism is concerned, thanks to you. Thank you. You're, it's very great pleasure to talk to you and a great honor. And I much appreciate it. And call me anytime. We'll talk again. Thank you so much. Thank you.